Hello, everyone. Welcome to our breakout panel discussion entitled Community Exploration Spaces. This breakout panel is for everyone interested in creating a community learning space at a park, a school, preschool, library, museum, etc. We have an amazing lineup of panelists who will walk us through how they successfully capture children's imagination, provide tips and recommendations for creating interesting spaces and activities, and reach a multi-generational family audience. I'll be serving as the moderator for our panel discussion. My name is Dr. Matilda Soria, and I'm Senior Director of the Early Care and Education Department of the Office of the Fresno County Superintendent of Schools. Joining me on this panel is Paul Reimer, who serves as the Executive Director of the AIM Center for Math and Science Education in Fresno, California, where he partners in collaborative efforts toward transdisciplinary equity center design for STEAM teaching and learning. Another panelist is Drew Serator, who serves as the director of Playful Learning, I love that title, of the Bay Area Discovery Museum. Drew brings over 10 years of experience in educational leadership and community engagement to the museum. Next, we have Barbara Daniel and Rosa Bunkun, who are actually my early care and education department team members here at the Office of the Fresno County Superintendent of Schools, or FCSS. Barbara serves as the Child Development Center Program Manager and has over 21 years of experience in the field of ECE, serving in instructional and leadership roles while working with diverse populations. Rosa serves as our Lead Master Teacher and has over 15 years of experience working with children ages 3 to 18. Finally, we have Claudia Ferreira from Math Talk. Claudia leads Math Talk's learning and engagement team and is dedicated to working toward creating playful and meaningful math experiences for families and children and underrepresented communities. Welcome to all of our panelists. We'll now begin our discussion with our first question, which I'd like to address to Drew. Drew, how do you create a mathematically or scientifically interesting installation? How do you get your ideas? Oh, that's a great question. Um, well, we're we're so lucky to be in the in the um, in the arena of of really trying to serve uh, children from zero to eight years old. So a lot of our ideas just come from being big kids ourselves, um, which, which is a lot of fun. But I like to think about when we start our planning with any mathematical or scientific installation. Um, really thinking about early engineering concepts and the relationship to the new NGSS standards. Um, you know, science has changed so much since when when I was a kid, and and you were, the standards were really related to like specific things you needed to know in science, how convection currents worked, that type of thing, to the the process of of learning science and experimenting with science. Um, so mostly we lean on uh, some of our research, which uh, one of our most recent articles that we put out was our Think, Make, Try framework, um, which is really just trying to simplify the engineering um, concept so that anybody feels confident in teaching engineering, getting kids to think about a problem, um, getting kids to make some sort of design around it, and then getting them to try it and realize that failure is just a part of the learning process. And so any of our designs really include that failure as part of a learning process to try and build that resiliency in our young kids. Um, and then uh, on top of it, the materials guide a lot of what we do. We want to simplify materials to the point that anybody thinks that they can be a mathematician or a scientist. So um, in our cardboard city right now, just having um, simple cardboard, simple tape, simple saw, uh, simple cutting tools, things that anybody might have around their house um, and, and let those kind of guide um, our build. Um, and where do our ideas come from? Um, some from my five-year-old, um, but uh, a lot of them um, just from watching our kids um, and, and going through this kind of think, make, try process and starting at the materials. I hope I answered the question and didn't just ramble aimlessly. No, you answered it perfectly. Okay. <laughs> So much. Um, any of our other panelists would like to add? Oh, I just I, I agree with Drew's um, approach. I think there's just so much to be um, found from exper experiencing or exploring playful interaction ourselves as as um, adults, as people, as parents, educators. Um, 
I think that just thinking about the things that can provoke joy or spark wonder, the kinds of things that you kind of walk by and go, oh, I want to try that. I want to get involved in that. Um, or just sort of that invitation to explore and things that really center wonder and joy and curiosity have been some of the things that have framed the, the kind of work that we're doing. But uh, yeah, uh, anything that's really... Um, uh, invites people to come into it and uh, see what they can do, see what they can make of it, see what they can do with their hands. What, what, how can they change what's happening in an exhibit or in an installation? Uh, some of the core ideas that that really promote uh, um, creative learning uh, in the work that we're doing. Thank you, Paul. The next question is is also for you, Drew. Oh, okay. what do you hope people take away from the installation. Yeah, I, that's a great question. I think um, just starting with the outcomes and thinking about the learning goals that we want the kids to have, um, but not just stopping there at, at that outcome, but thinking about how we hope that adults engage with their kids or adults engage um, in it themselves. Um, as, as adults and educators, we are constantly models for our kids in the learning process. And so thinking about um, not just the way we want the kids to engage, but the ways that we want the adults to engage and thinking about those specific outcomes. Do we want this to be focused on fine motor? Do we want this to be focused on um, design challenging? Do we want this to be focused on that fear of failure? Uh, do we want this to be focused on them getting some sort of mathematical concept out of it? And then how do we expect the adults to engage? And then how do we expect our team to engage with the adults and with the kids in order to do that? And so really focus on what are the open-ended questions? What are the types of questioning that you can do? What are the types of prompts that you can do with the adults? And then just thinking about that overall impact that we want not just this installation to have, but our organization to have uh, as a whole. And so that, that impact that these early playful learning experiences and engineering concept experience build that strength, that resiliency, that strength in kids, um, strength in families and strength in communities plays a huge role as we kind of design for outcomes first and then start to fill in the materials and the other things from there. Awesome, thank you, Drew. Any of our other panelists would like to add? Um, I'd like to add that um, that we also in hope that parents, our parents can take away a can-do attitude um, from the installations and in being able to see what they can do with their children at home with things like shadows or balls and ramps and different learning experiences that they may experience in programs with these installations and seeing the things, the rich experiences that they're able to provide with their children at home to really create that bridge between where the installation is and their homes. Yeah, I, I'd like to add, I, I think it's also really important that we are, are constantly, as we're thinking about the outcomes, reminding parents that there are a lot of these things they're doing naturally as parents um, and family members. And so just to be that reinforcer of like, look, we're doing something at a um, research based institution that you were doing last night in your kitchen um, and, and just building that confidence in families, too, is a huge part as we start thinking about the outcomes of, of um, some of our installations and exhibits and programs. And sorry, one more thought that I have, as um, Drew mentioned, the parents and that connection is, um, you know, as Drew shared, the parents are doing a lot of these things at home. Um, and it really provides us with an opportunity to share the learning and development that is attached to those experiences. So, for example, Drew mentioned about fine motor skills earlier. Parents may not know that their children manipulating objects with their hands is supporting their development or that, you know, talking about balls and ramps, connecting it to a book, giving their child um, a better interest in literacy. So really it also provides us that opportunity to support parents in understanding that they are contributing and connecting it to their, develop their child's development. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Drew. So our early care and education department of the Office of the Fresno County Superintendent of Schools leads the Lighthouse for Children Child Development Center, wherein we serve children six weeks to five years. And over the past few years, we've been partnering with the AIM Center and Paul and his team to implement installation uh, projects here uh, for our children. Um, so this next question is for you, Barbara, Rosa, and also Paul. What installation elements have you found that capture children's imaginations most? Um, in other words, tinkering, interactive technology, 
testing to see what will happen, movement, et cetera. And we'll go ahead and um, let Barbara and Rosa start. Thank you, Matilda. Um, for us here at the Lighthouse, um, we found that a combination of elements work best to support the engagement of young children's um, imagination when we think about tinkering, sounds, motions, movement, and testing to see what happens. Um, all children really have uh, experienced learning in a different way. And so it's really important that we focus on the various modalities of learning, visual, auditory, kinesthetic, and tactile learning. Um, some children may learn best through one modality, others learn differently through others or combinations. Um, so when I'm thinking, like when we're thinking about visual learners who might enjoy watching um, demonstrations or looking at graphs and images, there's a tactile learner who may learn through physical touch or uh, moving and manipulating objects. Uh, a kinesthetic learner may learn through role playing or moving about their environment. And then we have an auditory learner who may learn by listening to stories or visual repetition of information. So when we're really thinking about, um, you know, what's capturing the children, we're really taking those things into consideration in addition to the age and developmentally appropriateness of those activities, materials, or resources that are available in that space so that we're really able to capture how children learn best so that their imaginations can, can go to work. Um, so. I think for us, that's something we really try to make sure that um, we're thinking about when we're thinking about these designs. And it's also a collaborative process, right? There's not one person saying, oh, this is what we should do. We're also looking at what are the interests of the children? Where, What modalities have we seen um, with our children? How can we connect um, to each of those? For example, if we have the wind tunnel, um, you know, that's ensuring that that visual learner could watch if they're not ready to engage or that that tactile learner is able to touch and move and manipulate the objects. Um, so really just looking at what the, what experiences are um, going to be offered in the installation. Rosa, would you like to add? Okay, and Paul? Yeah, I think that um, when we're designing these uh, installations, it seems like some of the things that have um, kind of sparked children's imaginations most have been the things that um, where they can they can try out something and see the result of it, uh, so they can have a direct impact in the environment. Um, as Barbara is talking about the wind tunnel, I'm just thinking about yeah, a couple young children who created. Uh, a flying structure out of just some very simple paper cups that were were put together with some uh, some kind of a long ribbon on the end, and with by the, by themselves the paper cups kind of would float around at the bottom of the uh, base of the wind tunnel, but with that ribbon attached, it just created a little bit more of a lift to it, a little bit more wind resistance, and that thing would just float up all the way to the top. And then for a while, kids were really excited about seeing what they could put into the wind tunnel that would shoot out the top and get really excited when things would just fly up to the top, all the way up to the ceiling, and then kind of wait for them to come down. So they're exploring things like like lift and gravity and, and wind resistance. And at the same time, they're able to uh, create something that's delightful. There, there was There's so much laughter and joy and squeals of delight that are going on. And parents as well, kind of in that space, uh, providing... Um, providing some direction, but also really engaging in co-learning and co-play where the children are really taking the lead. The children are empowered to kind of really um, uh, create goals for themselves. And then caregivers are able to support that and support those investigations, but also playing uh, at the same time. So I would just say that, that those kinds of things that create that opportunity for delight and for wonder, for testing out ideas, and then also bring in caregivers as co-learners have been really, um, seem to have really been fun at this point. Thank you, Paul. Any other panelists like to weigh in? I can add. I, oh, go ahead. Um, yeah, I was just saying, um, Math Talk creates outdoor installations, outdoor math installations. And so we have found imagination sparks really well when we create open-ended conversations. And as Paul mentioned, kind of really tuning into that guided play. So what we do outside is we provide decals on the ground as conversation starters for parents and kids and caregivers. And so some questions we like to ask around the installations are, 
what do you notice? What do you wonder? What can you do with this? And we found really great success in that, in that um, imagination really, really being strong there when we really give them the option to explore rather than explicitly stating what math concepts might be embedded in the installation. Um, so I would just recommend that that open-ended exploratory um, angle is really successful in imagination building. Yeah, I, I really agree with that. And I think um, it, we have a uh, try it truck that we send out into different schools. It has different engineering um, uh, uh, experiments and things on it. And and um, kids are most of the two kind of major ones are that we have ramps and we ask the kids to build a car of the future that does something that you want it to do, keeping it really kind of open ended. And then we have the air tunnels as well and create a flying machine. Um, and it's always fun when you keep it super open-ended like that to see what different groups come up with. We had one group of fifth graders who decided they were going to try and see what the biggest thing that they could make that would fly was. And then all of them, all of a sudden working together in the sense of community and the cheering when this giant thing went up into the air and out of the tube um, was a lot of fun. And then the other thing I would just add on to, to Claudia there is um, we just had a super um, failed experiment with, uh, with a... Um, with a with an exhibit that was opening up called C cycle where it just it for whatever reason the C cycles didn't work but we painted these beautiful circles on the ground um to welcome these C cycles and the kids love these circles the C cycles aren't out there but the things that they're coming up with with these circles with just you know their bodies and their minds is just you know cooler than any C cycle creature could have been um, and watching that. So keeping it simple and, and introducing kids to, to concepts and remembering we're the guardrails in education. Education has changed so much from teachers standing in front and delivering all of their knowledge um, to us really getting to be the guardrails and asking these open-ended questions and seeing what kids come up with. It's a lot of fun. Awesome. Maybe we'll see more director of playful learning across, across the country. <laughs> The next question is for each of the panelists. What considerations go into the design when developing an installation? We'll go ahead and start with Claudia. Awesome, great question. Um, so once we have a location or a space confirmed for an installation, um, and that's decided alongside partners, we might have an idea of where a location might fit best for an installation, but through careful co-design, that often changes. Um, and so first we think about with our partners, you know, what is this space? Who uses this space? Who are the key stakeholders? Are they families, community members, educators and students, other early childcare folks? Um, we really try to understand who uses this space and how it's used. And from there, we really brainstorm with those key stakeholders what their specific learning goals are. So for example, if it's a school, are there any specific math concepts or learning goals that we wanna highlight? Um, and then also with community members, we talk about experiential and community goals. For example, we really ask the stakeholders, what are you hoping? We call them math trails over here at Math Talk. What do you hope this math trail adds to the community? Is it something that they want to uh, try to draw more residents to a specific location? Are they trying to create a more diverse community space? And so those are some of the questions that we ask. Um, in a space, we also think about what existing assets are there that are already embedded into the community? For example, uh, public art, uh, murals, parks, bus stops, those type of things. And we really think about in our team, how can we mathematize those already existing spaces that are embedded in the community? Um, many different considerations, which I believe personally adds to the emphasis in need for careful community co-design in collaborating with those key stakeholders to make these ideas come to life because we cannot answer these questions on our own. And it's really important to uplift the voices of the community members and you know those key stakeholders, as I mentioned. Thank you, Claudia. Um, Drew, would you like to add? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with everything Claudia just said, and I don't have a, a ton to add there. Um, you know, I think with zero with the zero through eight age, age range that we're looking at, we uh, constantly have to think about the resiliency of the um, of the exhibit um, and the installation to make sure that it 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 withstands um, a lot of three year old hands. Um, which, if you have uh, three year olds in your life, you know that um, you know my three year old breaks at least four things a day. Um, but the, uh, I think similarly, um, just really thinking about what the, what the outcomes are, um, that we want to go into the design and then, um, thinking about, I, I would again, bring up materials, um, 
and how the materials really unfold and 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 when really thinking about the materials how can we create an environment that doesn't feel really hard to reach for for families and communities um and and there's some element of surprise and awe but also that surprise and awe coming with oh my goodness i can do that at home i think is really important um but yeah i would say just that that thinking about your audience thinking about your materials and thinking about the outcomes would be the the primary things that we're considering Thank you, Drew. Barbara and Rosa. Yes, um, thank you. I also agree with uh, Drew and Claudia. And um, for us here at the Lighthouse, it's a little different because our installations are located inside um, our Child Development Center. And so for us, we selected a location um, for our math installations that we felt would be easily accessible for families, that children would be able to see and gravitate towards when they come in. Um, we also wanted to make sure that the space was warm and inviting for families. So we have like a couch in this space, we have child size seating and adult size seating. Um, it's also important to think about the languages, the predominant language of families that may be served so that if you have um, anything posted, any written materials, printed materials, signage, books in the space, then there are those cultural considerations and having um, materials or books offered in um, various languages of the pre predominant um, languages in your areas. And then also really just thinking about when it, when you may want the area to be accessible if it's in a program or specific space. Um, so for us, for example, in the mornings, parents are coming in and dropping off their children and trying to get to work. So we have to be very thoughtful of, um, you know, are the materials out or are we putting them out in the afternoon when parents are picking up and they tend to spend their most time, most time um, with their space. So I think for us, we're really trying to make sure that, um, that the area is, is warm and inviting the cultural considerations of languages are represented in, as well as um, ensuring that the materials that are available are age and developmentally appropriate. Um, because if you're serving infants and toddlers, um, then you wanna be mindful of choking hazards. And, um, and then you wanna think about size of objects. For little hands, they may need some, uh, objects that they can manipulate that are a little bit smaller, um, but again, meet the appropriate size so that if they're putting things in their mouth. Um, and then I would also say another consideration would be um, that the materials to ensure that they're durable, easy to replace in case um, something isn't there when you go back to check. And then also really thinking about who's going to be in charge of maintaining the space so that if there's things that are battery operated or that need to be charged, um, then, you know, making sure that that is available um, and then uh, that there's someone available to monitor that. And then the last thing I'd like to share is also just thinking about um, making sure that when you have things posted or materials that you're also considering the families, right? Because you don't wanna have something that has a whole bunch of writing that parents are expected to read it, you know, thinking about things that are short, simple, concise to the point. Um, and then any materials going to parents being considerate of uh, various reading levels and, um, and ensuring that anyone can pick up a document or a one pager and, and understand um, the information that's being shared. Rosa, anything from your side? Um, no, actually, I just I agreed with Drew, Claudia, and Barbara. Um, one thing that I would like to mention is also with the reading, the writing materials or any materials to ensure that it is at the child's eye level as well. And also that material is easily accessible. Thank you, Rosa. Thank you. Drew, What's would that? You, oh, would you like to add anything more, Drew? Uh, nope, I'm good. Thank you. All right. Any others before we go to the next question? All right. The next question is, do you co-plan with the community? And if so, what does the process look like? And we'll go ahead and start with Drew. Awesome. Yeah, I, I, 
I think um, I'm going to preface everything that I say here with uh, we need to do this more um, and more. But the, uh, the the installations that we do and uh, just the museum floor itself is uh, the, the tip of our iceberg. Um, underneath our iceberg, there's lots of research. Um, we do a lot of professional developments with with teachers in the community. Um, we're, we're working really closely with um, San Francisco Unified School District next year, particularly around um, their TK expansion. Um, and, and I think what our general philosophy uh, on this is, is we want to try to create an environment that um, doesn't just feel welcoming, but feels like uh, it can breed a sense, uh, a sense of belonging. Um, and I, I haven't found any way better to describe what we're going for here than, um, you know, I'm Jewish, born and raised Jewish. I've been in churches for, um, for weddings and for baptisms and things like that. Um, and each time I go to a church, I feel welcome, um, but I don't feel like I belong, right? Like I look around and the, the artifacts don't match my upbringing and my culture. And so we're trying to create this sense of belonging at our museum. And to do that, we've really got to listen. Um, I think listening becomes the key. So um, right now we, we've set up with a lot of our community partners with San Francisco Unified, as well as we have a connections program that goes out and works at um, subsidized preschools um, throughout the area near the museum and setting up um, just family, in, family listening nights um, where we do some play-based learning activities with the families in the community and then ask them questions about how we can be better neighbors and how we can set up our space better for success. And if you know our museum at all, we're, we're, um, we're in a national park, um, you know, buried beneath the Golden Gate Bridge where it's very hard to get there. There's one bus that comes about three quarters of a mile away and um, you have to be in pretty good shape to get up that hill at the end of the day to get back to the bus. Um, so there's a lot of issues with just, um, it, you know, it's hard to feel like you belong at a place if you can't get there without paying the $9 bridge toll. And so even we found with a lot of our community groups, we were giving out tons of passes, but we weren't getting the passes back and, and people weren't coming to the museum. And so just sitting down with the community and listening and hearing that the passes aren't that helpful, we can't get there. Um, and so now kind of redesigning and starting to figure out how do we just send a bus on a Saturday to the area where these schools are to a, to a pickup location and anybody on the bus come on into the museum for free um, versus just handing these passes out and, and forgetting about some of the major barriers that, that people have. And not to mention the barriers that national parks um, have a traditionally white affluent audience, museums have a traditionally white affluent audience. Um, and we're situated in Sausalito, which is a traditionally white affluent community. And so there's a lot of barriers there to, to really um, getting to be better neighbors um, to community members that we really want to partner with and serve. Um, so I think just getting to the listening aspects and, and starting to think about what are those things that are really going to uh, build a sense of belonging across the entire experience. It's not enough to just welcome people into the museum. It's how do you get there? How do you set up your, um, how do you set up, you know, the food situation to make sure people are comfortable? How do you set up? We have the ability, if somebody shows their EBT pass, they get uh, into the museum for a dollar. But what's that process like? Is that process uncomfortable for people? And so really trying to, to think about all of those processes and, and listen has been um, one of the biggest things that, that we're doing. This is a part of our new strategic plan um, that, that we're in our first year of. And um, so, like I said at the start, there is so much more needed, so much more listening that needs to happen to become these better neighbors. Um, but partnering with the community really just starts with, with listening and understanding um, and trying to, to better understand the community that you want to serve. Thank you, Drew. Claudia? Absolutely. I, I agree with Drew. Absolutely. Listening is so important. And often when you're working in communities that you might not belong to or not familiar with, that listening is even more important. And I think something that makes Math Talk really unique is that we've really embraced community co-design. And it is at the heart of everything we do and every experience we create. We create digital augmented reality experiences as well as installations, um, outdoor math trails. And so in that, we approach community co-design in a few different ways. Um, so in the case of a math trail, we had a recent community co-design in Holyoke, Massachusetts. And so they're interested in bringing a math trail to their community. And so when we have these community co-design sessions, so we went in person, we drove from Boston to, to Holyoke. We had um, an open event in City Hall. 
with uh, over 50 community members. And we come with questions um, similar to, you know, what if math was visible and vibrant and joyful, a part of all of our everyday lives, but what would that look like and feel like in your neighborhood, in your community? And really what would that mean for the kids around you and the adults that care for them? And so how that night went, um, we had a bunch of tables around. We had a lot of loose part materials. We had clay, sticks, crayons, markers, and um, we had a bunch of different locations for possible trail installation um, locations. And people went around and wrote their ideas for, for what could be included in the trail. And we have our feature installations, um, but we're also really open to hearing new ideas. And in this case, Holyoke, Massachusetts actually has one of the largest Puerto Rican communities in the entire country. And so they came up with this idea to create a domino installation. And I didn't know, but dominoes is a prominent um, pastime and enjoyment for uh, the Puerto Rican community. And so now we're in the process of designing a uh, domino installation, which is something we've never done. But that's just an example of how we really embrace community co-design. And it's not, you know, just listening is really important, but it's also creating action on that and, you know, how we can really uplift and implement the voices of the community members in those sessions. Um, another example in Cambridge, uh, where our headquarters are, we were creating a math trail that launched in October. And one of the locations was outside a housing um, facility. And when we were co-designing with some of the community members, we learned that that building used to be an old candy factory. And so they were like, how can we preserve the history of the candy factory and bring that into an installation? And so from there, also through community co-design, we created a candy circle um, math installation right outside the old candy factory. Um, and then another way we do co-design is um, we have a bunch of ongoing product development and that's for new trail ideas, but more so for our digital side. So we have a bunch of mini augmented reality games. And so what we do is we invite families to come in or we meet them where they are at, um, at different schools, at different housing facilities. And so what we'll do is we'll either have them come in or we'll go there. Um, it's a one hour play session is what we call them. You know, you might hear product testing or user testing. Like for us, it's play sessions because that's most important is to have fun and really like break down this math anxiety and to just show that math can be really fun. And so we bring them in and we do a little bit of free play, guided play, but then we uh, really put Math Talk products in the hands of kids and families. And what makes Math Talk really special is we'll record that feedback and we look for patterns and trends in that feedback and quite literally what the families and kids are telling us needs to change because they're the experts here is what we do in what we change in our product development, which I think is something really unique. Um, and so you know, they get paid $25 for coming in. And so we're really mindful of family's time. Um, and it's just a few different ways. It's but really at the core of everything we create and put out into the communities. Um, you know, for intending to support community members in a specific way, it's really important to have their say um, in what's actually being put out, um, intended to support them, you know. Awesome. Thank you, Claudia. Okay. If the other panelists would like to weigh in or add. I'll just say uh, that for some of the exhibits and installations we've partnered with at the Lighthouse, it's been it's been fun to think about installing the, the exhibit over a six to eight week period where there are opportunities to observe how families are interacting with it and then to make adjustments based on what we see them doing in, in, in real time. And so an example of that is for the, the light and shadow exhibit that is currently um, uh, at the Lighthouse. There's an opportunity for um, families and children to try different objects in front of a few colored lights and to see what kind of shadows are projected onto, onto a screen or onto the wall. And at first we had just some kind of cutouts and a variety of different objects. Um, but we also saw families just trying different things in front of the lights that they had with them. And we that sort of sparked some interest in um, providing more natural materials or things that might be found in environments or things that they that they might find at a park. So we have a, now a big pine cone. We have some a variety of different kinds of cedar uh, leaves and other kinds of coniferous types of leaves that really project some incredible shadows and things that could just be found objects. Um, so that's an opportunity for us to really think about how do we adapt the design of this installation based on how we see uh, the interactions going. And so 
Um, in that way, we think that participants have a real um, important role in helping to sort of evolve the design of an installation so that it begins to reflect more and more everyday experiences of those of those who are interacting with it. Thank you, Paul. We'll go ahead and move to our next question, which is how do you gauge the success of an installation? What do you hope an installation will accomplish? And we'll go ahead and start with uh, Barbara or Rosa. All right. Um, I think for us, we gauge the success of an installation in a few ways. Um, one way that we gauge the success of an installation is through visual observations of our families engaging. We observe whether the families are using the installations, are children gravitating toward them. Um, we observe, you know, what are parents doing with their children with the, while they're engaging in the installation, and how are their children responding to the materials and their parents. Um, because the ultimate goal is really to ensure that there's active participatory learning, um, not just for the child, but also for the parent, so that the parent and children are engaged. And so that's one thing that we're really able to see. Um, and then also from there, we're able to provide um, feedback and work with the AIMS team and have conversations and talk about things that are successful and um, things that we could tweak. And, um, you know, that's really been helpful. And then um, we also at one point created simple surveys for families to provide feedback and learn more about ways that we can enhance the installations in the future or change or modify or, or tweak. But I think our most successful um, way of gauging the installations has been through our observations and even more so um, than just watching and observing, but being a participant ourselves and um, being available to our families in case they have questions or um, want to watch us model or show them a different way to engage with their child. Um, sometimes parents will ask questions, well, my child created this, what can I do? And it's like, you can get in there and create too. Talk about what you're doing. Have conversations with your child. Um, you know, use mathematical terms. Like when we talk about the, um, our wind tunnel, you know, how high or low can it go when they are working with our shadows, getting in there with their children and moving the option, objects closer and further away to talk about distance. Um, could be pulling out a measuring tape and, and connecting it to the wall to see what, um, you know, how many inches something is when it's closer or further away. So we're really there to support our families um, if they need it or being available to answer questions. Um, I think that our hope is that the installations provide an opportunity for families to engage with their children in early math experiences that support their child's learning and development. Um, we also recognize that the parent is their child's first teacher, an essential partner in their child's learning and development. And we really want to ensure that families understand that role that they play and support them in making those connections um, to their child's learning through the experiences and, and installations that are offered. And also, you know, we want to make sure that families have the opportunity to support their child's um, academics to re reduce future achievement gaps um, when it comes to math and reading skills. Thank you, Barbara. Rosa, would you like to add from a teacher perspective? I'm and the, sure. the question is, how do you gauge the success of an installation? What do you hope an installation will accomplish? Um, you know, one thing that I have done or we have done as a team is we um, typically take children um, in small groups and introduce them to the installation. Um, therefore, they are front loaded. They're able to um, utilize it. We ask open ended questions to help them engage. And that way they could tell the parents as well. Um, as shared previously, sometimes, you know, there's limitations on time with parents. Um, so therefore, they're still able to utilize the installation just with us versus the parents. And then there's times there where they're like, Mom, Dad, you know, I did this and I did this. And we did shadows in the classroom and in outside the lobby. So they were able to do comparison as well. And so I think with that, um, providing them opportunities, um, rather if it's in classroom times or during arrival or pickup, um, we'll give them a little bit more incitement of, you know, seeing something new, being able to um, 
use their cognitive development and kind of think of like what um, what is available to them. Thank you, Rosa. And Claudia, would you like to add? Yeah, I think uh, very similar to what Barbara said, we really focus on the observations and really looking at the interactions at various installations with a specific focus on not only if families are using them, but if they're using them actively. And are we noticing family child interactions during observations? Are those, you know, like our name says, like are those leading to conversations around math? And are, is it facilitating math talk? And if so, and we're seeing those patterns, then I think that's a successful installation. Uh, math talk products themselves, um, we agree that teachers, um, families are the child's first teachers, and we really create our experiences with that in mind. Um, and the products are very focused on creating conversations and engagement between caregiver and child dyad. So our hope is that caregivers leave these installations feeling empowered to perhaps bring similar elements and conversations into their own home um, and to really like bridge that gap between what's happening in schools and what's happening out in the community. Um, on the digital side of things and like a more quantitative approach, we do look a lot at different scans of uh, QR codes that we have out at installations. Um, the QR codes at the specific installations are an opportunity for uh, caregivers and families to see additional uh, content online. And so we're able to look to see uh, what QR codes scans look like, which installations are being used. We like to see like new and repeat scans to show if families are coming back um, and if families are experiencing something new. But as I said, we really want families to be able to talk to each other about different math concepts, uh, which we do provide starting points for, as I mentioned, on those ground decals. Um, we really just want to see families returning to the installations and to continue to explore math conversations with their child and children um, in their own worlds, as well as out on the installations themselves. Thank you so much, Claudia. You know, and this our time has gone by too fast. We're having too much fun. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're, I'm going to go to our final question. Uh, what recommendations or advice do you have for people who want to create an installation in a community space? And if I could ask each of the panelists, maybe about 30 seconds, 30 to 40 seconds in your responses. And we'll go ahead and start with Drew. Um, yeah, I'd say, uh, you know, to to build an installation in a community space, um, talk to the community, um, understand the community that you're in um, and what their learning outcomes are and spend a lot of time on the pre-planning um, and the listening phase um, and knowing what you want to accomplish with with your installation. Um, and remember that that I, you know, I, I mentioned this briefly, just remember that you are um, any adults that are a part of this process are, are just the guardrails. You're going to find that kids come up with just amazing ways to use what you've created that you probably didn't even think of. And like, I j just remember that that's OK. And that's why you designed what you designed. And that's what the hope is. Um, so listen, be be those guardrails without trying to dictate the process too much. Um, have fun with it. Um, you get to design cool things for kids to do and there is no better thing to do in the world than that um so that would I, I would leave it with that thank you drew claudia yeah i'm trying to think what more i would add i think that i, I return back to the concept of intentionality a lot and so when you're listening to community members and really uplifting their voices um how does that translate to practice and how does that show up in your installations and really being intentional um around that and then the last thing i would add is when you do have eventually have an installation, um, I like to think a lot about how we can support and empower people that are going to be using it, whether that's in our case, educators and families, like what supports can we provide, um, whether that's additional content or adventure maps to use out on the map trails, like what different ways we can really uplift and celebrate and engage the installations themselves. And um, that's just something that I, I would recommend too. Paul? Yeah, I would just say to um, to think about designing something that can foster adult-child relationships. I think that um, that that the communication that can happen, the the love that happens between family members and caregivers and children as they get to explore and experience something together, to share ideas together, opportunities for them to design something together. Um, is just is so meaningful. So those that it's sometimes a hard target to to design something that can be uh, engaging for a wide variety of ages and and 
um, um, skill levels and abilities, but to do so and, and create that kind of relationship fostering, I think is really important. And Barbara and Andrew Rosa. Um, I think uh, the only thing I'll add, because everyone shared some really great information, is ensuring that the um, installations can be replicated um, by families at home, you, trying to utilize simple materials that um, make families feel like, oh, I can go home and do this. When we think about our lights and shadows, they just need a light and some a light and a dark space. You know, when we think about a wind tunnel, they can do it at home with the fan. Um, and when we're thinking about measurement, there's things they can post on the wall. So think about those things that your families can still do at home. It doesn't always need to be something super expensive or bright and shiny. It, the, those home um, recyclables are always very helpful um, for families to be able to replicate at home. Awesome. All right. Well, it looks like, again, time goes by just too fast when we're having fun. Um, I just want to thank all of our wonderful panelists that engaged in this discussion today. It really has been a pleasure. We hope that all of the participants are leaving here today feeling inspired to create and or enhance community learning spaces for children and families focused on early math in your communities. Again, thank you and we hope you have a great rest of your day here in the Early Math Symposium. Thanks everybody. Thank you.